Okay, well, welcome to the panel number eight. This is on renewable energy. Uh, you might wonder what's a renewable energy panel doing in a climate change conference. I'll just tell you in Ontario, for example, they're spending $7 billion, they're about halfway through it, to install wind turbines, thousands of them all over the province. And if you actually look at the green energy plan for the province, what do you think is driving the move to wind turbines? It's climate change, okay? Same thing with the biofuels, same thing with solar panels. There are so many things that are being pushed, and they're calling it clean energy. Okay, this is one of the great misnomers. So we may not hear directly climate change, you know, climate change policy, but in many cases it really is. And I've been pushing people who are against biofuels, against wind turbines, to say, look, bring up the climate issue. If you're looking to kill a dragon, you have to go to its heart. You can't just tiddle around at the edges of it, okay? You know, tip off his toenail. I mean, you really have to look at why are they pushing these issues. So it's very appropriate for, to, for it to be at a climate change conference. The first speaker is John Draws, and I'll just read his introduction here. John received undergraduate degrees in physics and mathematics from Boston College and a graduate degree in physics from Syracuse University. He subsequently worked for General Electric, Aerospace Electronics, and others as he listed here. After retiring at 34, he began a lifelong commitment to being an environmental activist, or I should say advocate, that's a better term. His interest and expertise in energy matters and sea level rise are extensions of that. John's position is that our energy and environmental policies should be based on genuine science. Several years ago, he joined the Sierra Club with the hope that as a member, he'd have more success in finding out the basis of their energy policy. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. <laughs> After spending months working his way up the food, ch food chain, he finally got to speak to their national energy person. When asked what scientific studies the Sierra Club had done to base their renewable advocacy on, she acknowledged that they had done none. <laughs> she said they relied on the conclusions of the Union of Concerned Scientists. <laughs> <laughs> he subsequently started contacting UCS, or Union of Con Concerned Scientists, um, for the same information and eventually got to the top person in that organization. The short answer is that they had done no scientific studies either. They relied on others, like wind energy lobbyists, for their data. So it goes in the environmental community. So here is John's take on renewable energy as a scientist using wind power as an example. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to come today to briefly talk about wind energy. I want to thank James Taylor, Nikki Comerford and Heartland staff for their gracious help they provided in setting this all up. I've worked on environmental issues for some 30 years. My core concern is that our energy and environmental policies are driven by lobbyists rather than being based on genuine science. As such, the conference's topic of real science, real choices resonates strongly with me. President Obama has rightfully stated that energy is one of the top three issues facing our country. I'm all about educating citizens. That said, please remember that I'm a scientist, not a professional speaker. Here's my candid view of giving talks like this. Anyways, my expectation isn't that you're going to be energy experts by the end of my presentation. What I do hope, though, <laughs> is it will get you thinking. I've given my full energy presentation some 10 states now, and this normally takes about an hour and 15 minutes. One of the first things I tell the audience is, this is technical stuff, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence by pretending to be able to summarize this matter in 20 minutes. Today I'm going to try to summarize this matter in 20 minutes. The good news is that the full presentation is available on the internet, so you can go online at your own convenience and go through it at your own pace. In addition, the online version has sample references for much of the material you'll see here today in my talk. At the end, we'll answer questions you have. So how did we get into the energy mess we're in? Well, I'm a history buff, and I believe the adage of those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I've always had a fascination with the earlier years of our great country. An interesting character of those times was the snake oil salesman. 
No matter what these hucksters were selling, it all comes down to making as much money as they can off of a mark. It may seem that these shysters were pretty crude, but the reality is they used some very sophisticated techniques to separate citizens from their hard-earned cash. But when you take away the fast-talking shenanigans, the con men's success comes down to these two things. Number one, they're telling us things we want to hear. And number two, we're not really verifying the truth of what they're saying. Most people today think that anyone who bought Kickapoo juice to cure cancer must have been really gullible. But are we any different? Look at how many educated and supposedly financially astute people were taken advantage of by Bernie Madoff. A simply astounding number. One of the reasons that things are worse today is that through the internet, 100,000 people can be sent misinformation within seconds for free. And there's no real culpability for making specious, unsupported claims. So in some ways, we've come full circle. It may not be apparent, but we're really part of a clever one-two marketing campaign. First, we're told that the planet is facing imminent catastrophe. Then the salesperson comes to our community with a solution. The spiel is that we can do something consequential to help prevent this global disaster, and we can create jobs and make some easy money in the process. What a deal. It should be obvious, but here's the anecdote for solicitations that sound too good to be true. In my very limited time, I'm going to give you a few thoughts about the second item. Just in case you want to quote me, here's the overview of my basic, very simple position. We do have environmental and energy issues, and they need to be solved by using real science. My main concern here is that our energy and environmental policies are not based on real science. Instead, these policies are being dictated by lobbyists, salespeople, who are representing those with financial interests or political agendas. This isn't good for U.S. citizens or businesses. To counter this, citizens need to get educated and then do some critical thinking, which has become somewhat of a lost art. What is critical thinking? Well, it's a thorough, open-minded, logical effort to examine a claim in the light of all applicable evidence. The fact is that nothing of real value comes easily, and that includes using your head. During this thinking process, a key scientific ingredient to keep on hand is a healthy dose of skepticism. Well-known scientist Carl Sagan had several good science observations, like some you see here. Regarding critical thinking, he said, skeptical scrutiny is the means by which deep thoughts can be separated from deep nonsense. I'm here today primarily wearing three different but related hats. Number one, I'm a physicist who's used to investigating complex issues like wind energy in a thorough, organized, logical, and open-minded manner. Number two, I've got financial experience. For example, through implementing some of my investment ideas, I was able to retire at 34. My last full-time job was a management position at GE. Thirdly, as I've already mentioned, I've worked for some 30 years on environmental issues like promoting better New York State water quality standards. During this time, I belonged to several environmental organizations, like the Sierra Club, and at no time have I been paid by anyone. When I first heard about industrial wind energy, I was a supporter. Now, after doing some research and critical thinking, no more. The fundamental reason for my opposition is very simple. Industrial wind energy fails to deliver their goods. By this, I mean that it's not a technically sound solution to provide us electricity or to meaningfully reduce global warming, and it's not an economically viable source of energy on its own, and it's not environmentally responsible. These three basic criteria haven't been selected to make wind power look bad, but are what should be used to evaluate the legitimacy of any proposed new alternative source of energy. Since most people today like things translated into sound bites, here it is. Maybe it's been too long since I got out of graduate school, but my recollection of how real science is supposed to work is this. When a new idea is proposed as a potential solution of a problem, it's up to the solution proponents to prove its efficacy, not the other way around. Here we have businessmen, investors, and opportunists proposing that wind power be an integral part of our energy policy. So the ball is in their court to provide comprehensive, independent, transparent, empirical proof 
that wind power is a viable solution. This is extremely important in how real scientific assessment works. Unfortunately, this was never required of or provided by wind power proponents. There is no more cost-effective position we can take than to insist that our energy and environmental policies be based on real science. As you can see, a comprehensive scientific assessment actually includes three considerations, technical, economic, and environmental. That's what I'm going to cover now, but again, because of time constraints, I'll just touch on one part of each of these three carrier. There is much more in my online version. There are many technical liabilities with wind energy, <coughs> excuse me, and this is a significant one that has been inadequately addressed, even by knowledgeable people like those at the EIA. There is a fundamental difference between wind energy and all other conventional sources of electricity. A technical term that explains this is capacity value. Wind energy has a capacity value of less than 10%, while nuclear power, for example, has a capacity value of almost 100%. A layman's way of looking at this is, what degree of confidence do I have that such and such wind facility will be producing its rated power at 4 p.m. two weeks from now? Almost none. Because of this profound technical difference, wind energy must be augmented by a, a fast responding source of electricity, which is usually gas. Consider what this unusually honest ad from a utility company is telling us. Quote, integrating the variable capacity of wind energy undermines the time-tested, science-driven technology plan required of all utilities, and that just isn't right. This is a utility company saying this. And this stunningly frank admission from the CEO of one of the world's largest utility companies. He said that if we had to rely more on wind energy, quote, families would have to get used to only using power when it was available rather than constantly, unquote. The point of all this is that all claims for costs and benefits of wind energy simply must include this necessary augmenting gas source. The fact that the wind lobby does not properly address this in any of their advertising materials is a sleight of hand trick that they are hoping we won't notice. Part two, environmental issues. I periodically hear that citizens and some organizations support the idea of wind energy as it is supposedly green. It's not surprising that many good people think wind energy is green as that's one of the many sales pitches they've been bombarded with. But is it true? Again, because I'm on the clock here, let's just look at one key component of each turbine. Many thousands of pounds of rare earth elements used in such things as generator magnets. It's unlikely that you know much about rare earth elements, but if you look it up, you'll see that refining them is a long, messy process that usually involves dozens of steps, each one resulting in serious air, water, and land pollution. Unfortunately, I know of no U.S. media or environmental organization that has adequately reported on this horrific situation, but here are the stark conclusions from an English investigation. So what does this all mean? Well, here are some environmental consequences for this one part of a turbine. The processing of the rare earth elements for just a modest 300 megawatt wind project destroys 60,000 square meters of vegetation, generates 18 million cubic meters of highly toxic air pollution, pollutes 86 million gallons of wastewater, making it poisonous produces 1.8 billion pounds of contaminated tailing sands and results in 300,000 pounds of radioactive waste. How do these facts jive with the mission statements of the environmental organizations that are supporting wind energy? And yes, you heard correctly, an enormous amount of radioactive waste results. How green does that sound to you? There are a variety of other environmental issues, and some of these are explained more in my online presentation. Bird and bad impacts are an example of these. The bottom line is that the only thing really green here are the profits from the salespeople and their clients. It is also interesting to note that once we start looking closer, we can see that other common claims made by wind power peddlers don't hold up well either. 
Here's a recent quote from the head of a major European environmental group. Quote, industrial wind projects don't work. They produce a trickle of electricity, a vast cost to the consumer. They desecrate the landscape and make people's lives a misery. And they don't even cut carbon emissions. They are literally a waste of space, unquote. I couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> it's good to see some environmentalists on the side of real science. OK, part three, this is our last part. We need to talk a bit more about economics because that's usually the driving force in cash-strapped communities, which, of course, the salesmen know full well. The analogy I'm going to use is that we have a choice in which direction to go. It amounts to taking science street or money circle. <laughs> Again, because of time constraints, I simply cannot go into the entire economic situation, but we'll cover enough to make you more aware of what's really going on. The average citizen usually isn't too concerned about the bigger picture, but they should be because wind energy is a bad deal from an electricity point of view. Why? Well, because its total costs, its ratepayer costs, and the taxpayer subsidies are more expensive than any conventional source of electricity. How is this good for our economy? Let's quickly look at these three areas. Here's the total cost part calculated by the federal government. And for the several reasons stated on the slide, the wind costs are actually much higher than shown here. How about the ratepayer costs? It's simply astounding that these people have the audacity to claim that wind energy is less expensive. Here's a recent case in North Carolina where all three of the utility companies in the state refused to buy the electricity coming from a proposed wind project as it was way more expensive than other options they had. Here's an example of public statements made by utility executives saying that onshore wind is two to three times more expensive than conventional sources and offshore four to five times. None of this should be a surprise as there is plentiful evidence saying that this is a fact of reality. For instance, look at this information from the IEA. It shows how the higher the proportion of wind energy there is in a country, the higher the cost of electricity. Denmark has the highest percentage of wind energy in the industrialized world, and it also has the highest residential electricity rate, over three times the U.S. rate. Yet in spite of these realities, these smooth talkers claim that this is good for consumers. Simply amazing chutzpah. And lastly, there is the taxpayer part. Here are the EIA's latest figures reporting on annual taxpayer money going to electricity sources. Note that the taxpayer subsidy money for wind energy exceeds the subsidies for all other conventional sources combined. Yet in a sample wind developers marketing document recently, it clearly says right here, you can see, that no project money comes from taxpayers. <laughs> you tell me how this is an honest statement. Okay, how about regional economics? Although probably everyone here would say they full well know there's no free lunch, that is exactly a major tactic used by wind promoters. They carefully cultivate the idea that anything coming from them is found money. The trick is that it's not coming from them at all. This depiction says it much better than I can. <laughs> so how do careful people make an intelligent decision when they receive what seems like a very attractive proposition? My suggestion is, with critical thinking, to carefully answer these four economic questions. So let's quickly do that right now. Number one, the conclusion from this is to take all non-guaranteed claims with a huge amount of salt, as anything that's not guaranteed has very little credibility, particularly from people who are addicted to wild exaggerations. Another big unknown claims sound good, but of course that is exactly the basis for every con developed. This is a key one, so we need to look at this closely and conservatively. I don't have time to go through all of the economics here, but there are a few quickies. The Scottish government funded the most comprehensive study ever done on the effects of wind development on tourism. By the way, the Scottish government is a promoter of wind energy, so they had a vested interest here. Despite this, they concluded that there would be a net decrease in tourism. When farmers stop, start getting turbine lease payments, some reduce their farming and others quit the business. It wouldn't be surprising if 25% of local leasing farmers cut back on their operations, laying people off and reducing local expenditures. 
Independent studies have also concluded that wind projects have an adverse local meteorological impact for up to 15 miles away. This has many problematic financial consequences like reduced crop yields. Here's a government-sponsored study by four independent PhDs, all acknowledged bat experts. What's most interesting about this study is that these experts took the trouble of putting a dollar value due to bat loss for each U.S. county. I've already included a few slides from a proposed wind project in a relatively small North Carolina county. Here it shows that, that, ag that agricultural loss to that county from bat deaths due to turbines could be up to almost $7 million per year. That alone far outweighs the unsecured promises of the developer. To be an equal opportunity presenter, let's consider jobs and economic picture for offshore wind. Here is a study that was just released in February about a proposed small New Jersey, New Jersey offshore wind project. Note that this study was done by independent experts and paid for by the state of New Jersey, and that state is promoting offshore wind. Here is their conclusion about net jobs. Quote, increases in electricity rates from this wind project will lead to a reduction in New Jersey employment of 864 to 2,000 jobs per year. In total, this will result in a cumulative employment loss of some 30,000 job years, unquote. Here's their conclusion about net economic benefits. Quote, this wind project will result in a net reduction of New Jersey output of $911 million. Net reduction. Just to cover the bets, the two main New Jersey state agencies involved with this offshore wind project hired different consultants to assess the overall merits. Oops, the second consultant came back with exactly the same conclusion. Offshore wind does not make sense from any economic perspective. And read what the LA Times investigation concluded. Quote, even though a record 10,000 megawatts of new wind generating capacity came online, few jobs were created and wind power manufacturing unemployment fell. So adding these items up, we can see that the net picture is a jobs and economics loss. And the answer to question four is yes. Yet another liability of going down the wind energy path that it puts our country further in debt with more money being borrowed from China. Beware, picking your pocket while distracting you with pretty promises is a favorite wind developer tactic. So we are at a juncture, and this is our choice. Another way of looking at our paths is that we have a choice to go backwards to 18th century ideas or to go forward. We can listen to the puff power proponents and for sure they will paint us a rosy picture. That's their job. They will tell us carefully crafted enticing stories about how the shortcut through the woods is easy money. Anything we bring up to express a concern about the peddlers very well rehearsed to dismiss is not being a problem. How many times did Bernie do exactly that? But be forewarned. When reality hits, we will be on our own. My plea to you is do not take the bait. I finally run out of my allotted time. If you found this thought provoking, please go to my website, which has my online presentation that explains much more and also has my email address. I've also passed out this new uh, Renewables Energy book. You're the first people in the world to see it. This is the world release. This is the best uh, uh, booklet, brochure on renewable energy, to my knowledge, any place. Thank you for your time. That was fine.